Jim Garlow, and we have Father Frank Pavone. Someplace they're in the audience, so I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Great to be joining you on this day before the March for Life. It is Thursday, the 28th of January. As you can imagine, a lot of uh, very, very important and busy things are going on uh, here at our headquarters. And I will be flying up to Washington, D.C. tonight. And uh, tomorrow there will be a representative group of uh, leaders taking uh, part in a march but the march for life is virtual this year as you've been told and uh it is uh something you can follow over at marchforlife.org but today i want to spend a few moments with you looking a little bit more deeply into the decision that launched this whole controversy in the first place and why we have the march for life at this particular time of year why do we have it in late January. Well, of course, it's because on January 22nd of 1973, 48 years ago now, uh, the Supreme Court handed down Roe versus Wade. And this is, this is the decision, together with Doe versus Bolton, two abortion decisions meant, as the court said, to be read together, decisions which effectively brought us abortion on demand in the United States of America. We're going to look at this a little bit because we need to know, we need to be able to explain to people what this decision says, its, its weaknesses, and uh, a little bit of its history, what it does not say. I want to start unpacking that for you, and we'll do more of that in uh, the days to come after the march. Because the more we can explain to people what Roe v. Wade is and isn't, the better case we can make to the American people that we need to end legal abortion. But before we go further into that, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life and for the wisdom and strength you've given us to defend it. We know, Lord, that there is no one more vulnerable, more weak, more in need of our help, more in need of our voice than the child in the womb. And so we ask you, help us to protect them. Show us the ways to restore for them the legal protection that the rest of us have. And always keep us vigilant against the efforts of the abortion industry to weaken the law or to expand their business of killing babies. Enable us, Lord, to save lives and to bear witness to you, the Lord of life, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, let's just look at a couple of facts about Roe v. Wade. We'll use our whiteboard here. January 22nd of 1973. Interestingly, the reason a lot of people ask, well, why did it come down in January? Because you know, nowadays, we're used to having the controversial Supreme Court decisions come down at the end of June. The, the, the term of the Supreme Court goes from the beginning of October each year to the end of June. Then they take a break, July uh, and um, August and September. But uh, 
October through June. And, you know, it's become the pattern that controversial decisions, including major abortion decisions, are handed down at the end of June. But back in 1973, what happened with this Roe v. Wade case, and as you may recall, okay, so Roe v. Wade is a case that arose out of Texas, together with Doe v. Bolton, a case that arose out of Georgia. And though I won't spend time right now talking about them, I knew the Jane Roe and the Mary Doe of these cases, the plaintiffs, the, the petitioners, uh, as they are as they are called, who um, actually both of whom did not have abortions and in fact were opposed to abortion, believe it or not, and then became pro-life activists uh, and working in, in tandem with me and with others in the movement. Uh, in fact, uh, the row of where we wait, I received into the Catholic Church, and they wanted to see these decisions reversed. But that's just a little side note. Right now, I want to look at more of the technical, legal aspects of this. But these cases arose out of these two states. And um, the reason, as I was starting to explain, that this came down in January is an interesting reason. The justices wanted the, they realized that these cases were going to introduce big changes in state laws regarding abortion. We'll say for a moment, we'll talk, talk for a moment about uh, what the states were saying up to that point uh, about abortion. And they, they realized that this was going to throw into doubt or into, um, really into obsolescence what a lot of these state laws were. And so they figured, well, in January, by the middle of January, the state legislatures were reconvening for their annual work. And so therefore, if this decision comes down, right at the time that the state legislators are starting to do business again for the year 1973, they can look at the decision and then they'll be able to right away reform their law or introduce new laws so that there won't be a gap or a vacuum leaving abortion in limbo and leaving people with all sorts of unresolved questions. Well, in matter, as a matter of fact, what ended up happening was they underestimated the complexity and the level of confusion that these opinions thrust onto the states. And we've been in a vacuum of confusion ever since. Because what was going on from around 1967 to, uh, well, let's put it this way, 67 to 70, there were a lot of state law changes in abortion. The uh, abortion started to become more permitted, and um, there were, because up to then, the states protected the unborn. And so you had uh, mostly reform laws. Let's reform our law on abortion, repeal laws. Let's just get rid of the old thing and start from scratch. But then, starting in 1970 and going into 71, 72, you had not so much state law change. About 13 states changed their laws. And then 71 to 72, you had a lot of courts taking up the question of abortion laws in the various states. It was essentially a state matter. Um, you actually also had two referenda. That's where instead of the legislature passing a law or the court issuing a decision, it goes to a vote of the people who directly decide what the policy is going to be. There were two referenda. Uh, in 72, in the states of Michigan and North Dakota, and both of them, both of those votes from the people, upheld the protection of the unborn, upheld the pro-life policies in those states. At this time, let's see, uh, I need the uh, eraser. Uh, at this time, no state across the 50 states, had a policy which ended up being the Roe v. Wade policy. And this is important uh, for you to understand. 
because this has been so widely misrepresented and misunderstood to this very day, even though it's been um, 48 years, no state allowed abortion on demand throughout pregnancy. And that stands to reason, and that makes sense. You know why? Because the American people have never, in any state, much less nationally, bought into that idea that at any time in pregnancy, for no other reason than the mother wants it, that someone would be allowed to abort their child. The American people have never bought into that idea. Never. And yet, that's exactly the policy Roe v. Wade and Dovey Bolton brought us. They brought us a policy of abortion on demand throughout pregnancy. The USA has that policy, and guess how many other nations do? Out of the, what is it, 195 or close to 200 countries in the world, how many have this policy of abortion on demand? Including the United States? Count them. Four. Canada, well, Canada has no law at all regarding abortion. So it's a free-for-all. Do what you want. China. You want to guess what the fourth one is? Think, whose company do we not really want to be in? You know, China, North Korea. That's it. All the other nations protect their unborn children. Now there's a handful of other nations. Oh, let me see. Maybe six other countries. Remember, we're talking out of a pool of close to 200 countries. Maybe six other countries besides these will allow abortion beyond, beyond uh, the, the 14 weeks, uh, beyond 20 weeks. But I mean, all throughout pregnancy, only these four. It's not, not exactly a good company to be in. What's interesting is, is uh, how, how the decision got to that point. And these are a few basic facts about Roe v. Wade that we need to understand. Um, first of all, let me say this. Roe and Doe were the first major abortion decisions uh, by the Supreme Court. There, were, there was a, a, a case or two before this that they were, they were dealing with. It was a case that came out of D.C. Uh, and, and so forth. But nationally, these are, this was the beginning. But the first fact to keep in mind here is that the court has issued dozens of further abortion decisions since Roe and Doe that have weakened Roe. You know, it's interesting how the Democrats will say, oh, we, and Biden will say, oh, we want to codify Roe v. Wade. Well, they're going to have to decide what version of Roe v. Wade they want to codify because this, the Supreme Court has changed it radically. In fact, has all but dismantled it and left only what they call the central holding in place. And we'll look at it for a, mo in a moment at what that central holding is. But it's issued dozens of decisions since then. It's been like 30 major decisions on, on uh, abortion uh, since Roe v. Wade. The second thing to keep in mind is that the court overstepped the judicial role. And, and this will take us into what exactly it said. So let me just explain to you for a moment what I mean. 
a court is supposed to judge disputes. And those disputes may have to do with the constitutionality of a law. But the ju a court is supposed to have parties come before it who have standing. That means they've incurred some kind of injury as a result of the action of another person or the action of the state. And they're asking the court to, to vindicate their rights, right? Or to judge, judge between the parties and resolve the dispute. That's all that a court is supposed to do. What it's not supposed to do is to write public policy or create law. Roe v. Wade created public policy. They did not just decide a dispute. If they had just decided a dispute, they could have, when Norma McCorvey, the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade from Texas, came before the court and said, you know, I'm being harmed here because of Texas's anti-abortion law. You know, I want to have an abortion and this law isn't letting me do so. Judge, on, judge in my favor. They could have said, and actually when you look at the history of Roe v. Wade, they were going to say, originally Justice Blackmun, who was the one that originally wrote the decision, was going to simply say, that the decision was Texas law on abortion was unconstitutionally vague. Now, if in order for a law to be constitutional, it has to be clear. One of the reasons for unconstitutionality is vagueness. If you don't know what the law requires you to do or prohibits you from doing, how can you follow it, right? If it's so vague, if you don't know, if you're walking on eggshells, or I don't know if what I'm about to do breaks the law or doesn't break the law, you're supposed to be able to know by looking at the law itself. So that's why, why vagueness is a grounds for unconstitutionality. And they were going to say originally, oh, well, it's just, it's unconstitutionally vague. You see, if they, were, if they had said that, what question does it not answer? What it, the question it does not answer is, well, does a woman have the right to get an abortion? Under the Constitution, does she have a right to get an abortion? For if the court had been more reserved, more restrained, more conservative in the sense of not overstepping its bounds and simply said, we find the law in Texas to be unconstitutionally vague, that would have been a ruling on the constitutionality of the law. And then it would have been up to the legislature to make it more clear. In other words, okay, you're handing it down you know, middle to the end of January, the legislatures are coming back into session. They can work out the details. They can sort out the details. They can have hearings. They can investigate the matter. They can make it clearer. If it was too vague, they can make it clearer. But that's the job of the lawmakers who are accountable to the people. This was the path it was on originally. And this would have been a court type of activity, okay, and then it would have moved to a legislative activity. What happened instead is that some of the more uh, pro-abortion justices prevailed upon Justice Harry Blackman, the author of the, of the decision, to say, don't just say that it's vague. Answer the question of does a woman in the United States have the right to an abortion? They wanted him to get to that core question. And in fact, long story short, he did. They did. The justices decided, okay, let's address that question. Well, not only did they address that question in two, in two basic ways, but they, in, they created an entire policy on abortion and they federalized it. Let me explain everything I just said. A basic answer to the question was twofold. 
Yes, under the privacy provisions of the Constitution, emanations, penumbras, shadows. You can't find the word abortion in the Constitution. You find the word liberty in the 14th Amendment, and they said, well, this concept of liberty includes privacy, and the concept of privacy includes the right whether or not to bear or beget a child. Now, interestingly, what had happened here was that just before Roe v. Wade, the court decided two cases about contraception. One of them striking down a Connecticut law that was the only law in the country criminalizing the use of contraception in marriage. That was the Griswold decision out of Connecticut. And that was supposed to be very limited to actions within marriage in the bedroom. In fact, it was even pointed out, this does not, in, in the arguments of that case, it was pointed out, this doesn't involve abortion because abortions aren't happening in the bedroom. This is marital privacy. That was the Griswold decision about contraception, contraceptive use by married people. Then there was a decision, Eisenstadt versus Baird, another person whom I know, by the way, who's still alive. I actually have a friendship with him, but he's considered the father of the pro-choice movement. Baird challenged a Massachusetts law prohibiting the sale, not the use, but the sale, of contraceptives to single people. And uh, that case struck down that law. And what happened was that this idea of privacy to bear or beget a child took root with that decision. And the justices were just at the point where they were beginning to have the um, uh, oral arguments about Roe v. Wade. And so they took that up. Uh, they took that concept up. Now notice, first of all, bear or beget a child um, is nothing to do with kill a child. Those who want to assert the right as to whether or not they're going to have a child, well, of course, nobody's going to force you to have a child. In that sense, we're, we're in favor of the freedom. Now, we, we teach God's plan about how you have a child. Within marriage, one man, one woman, validly married, open to the gift of new life, right? And that's why morally contraception is wrong. But nobody's forcing you to have a child. But the, but the right to bear or beget a child has nothing to do with the right to kill one. Oh, I don't want to bring a child into the world. Well, what world do you think the child is in now? If the child is in the womb, the child exists. It's not a question of whether to have a child. It's a question of whether to kill a child. But in any case, not to go too deep into that, they said, yes, under privacy, a woman has, the privacy is broad enough to encompass the right to have an abortion. And number two, the word person does not include the unborn. The word person in the Constitution, Roe v. Wade said, does not include the unborn. Notice how it's a decision of exclusion. Now, in answering this, they went ahead and they created their own public policy thus overstepping their bounds and going into the realm that is supposed to be taken care of by legislators. And they said they divided the nine months of pregnancy into three trimesters. In the first trimester, no state interference whatsoever. In the second trimester, the state may regulate abortion 
for the woman's health. And in the third trimester, actually, what they did was they used a viability. They used a viability boundary. They said the state may even, doesn't have to, but may even prohibit abortion for the sake of the child, which it called potential life. Of course, we know it's actual life. But notice what happened here. Actually, when you again, when you look at the history of how Roe v. Wade came about, originally there was nothing said about viability, which of course is a changeable concept. It changes with time. Can a baby survive outside the womb? Well, that depends on what year you're talking about. It depends on the development of medical science, right? The age of viability, whether a child can, can, can survive or thrive, or survive in a healthy, stable way, after uh, being born early, that date has been getting earlier and earlier and earlier, thanks to the development of medical science, right? And so uh, we're getting better and better success earlier and earlier in the early 20s now, um, early 20 week period, 20, you know, 24, 23, 22, we're, see we're seeing better and better results. So, but this was where, was, where was the term viability in the arguments of Roe v. Wade? Did it come up in... By the way, this case was argued twice. Let me just put a little parenthesis here. This was argued in December of 71 and again in October of 72. And the reason it got argued again is that two justices of the Supreme Court before the first argument suddenly retired due to poor health. Justice Black and Justice Harlan retired. So now instead of nine justices, you only had seven. And some of the justices said, you know, we really ought to re-argue the case uh, when there is a full court. And there was actually a, a, a notion at the beginning that some of them uh, actually were, were under that we were not dealing with the substantive question of whether abortion should be allowed, but we were only dealing with a procedural question about whether federal courts could intervene in matters that they be, were being dealt with by the state courts. So in other words, at the beginning, the idea was that the Roe v. Wade case was only about procedure procedural questions. And, oh, well, you know, we could do that with seven justices. You know, can federal courts deal with, um, intervene in issues being pending in the state courts? But it ended up, of course, dealing with a much more substantive question than that. It, 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 long story short, it was argued two times. By October 72, President Richard Nixon had put two more justices on the court and there was also the idea that at the beginning, with the seven justices, it would be a four to three decision in favor of abortion, striking down uh, those Texas and Georgia laws, but that if President Nixon added two more justices on the court, those two would go along with these three, and it would end up being a, um, a uh, well, to keep consistent here with the, a, a four to five decision in favor of protecting the unborn, in favor of the Texas and Georgia laws. That's what was thought. It didn't end up happening that way because of all the maneuvering among the justices and the arguments. It ended up being a 7-2 to two decision against the laws and opening up, as we said, abortion on demand. But those laws didn't talk about viability. 
And in the arguments, both the first set of oral arguments in 1971 and in the second set of arguments in 1972, was viability brought up at all? No. How about in the briefs, in the documents that were submitted to the court by various groups on both sides of the issue? Did the concept of viability come up? No, it didn't. This expansion of the abortion right all the way through pregnancy, because remember, Roe versus Wade said even in the period after 28 weeks, even in the seventh, eighth, and ninth month of pregnancy, the state could allow it. It may prohibit it, doesn't have to. And in fact, it said it may not prohibit it for reasons of health, which are not just, you know, your liver is failing, but it said health includes all factors physical, psychological, these are exact words of the court, by the way, emotional, familial, and the woman's age. All these are relevant to the patient's, to the uh, well-being of the patient. Dovey Bolton said, Dovey Bolton brought in this expansive definition of health, which is the exception that swallows the rule. In other words, that's why legal experts right from the beginning have said that Roe v. Wade gave us abortion on demand. On demand. Throughout pregnancy. Oh, I'm too young to have a child. You can be perfectly healthy. Your liver is functioning just fine. Your heart doesn't have a problem in the world. Blood is great. No diseases whatsoever. You're not even on any medications. Oh, but I'm too young to have a child. These decisions say you present yourself for an abortion eight months pregnant, the state cannot protect that baby. Originally, what the justices were looking at was to say after the first trimester, that's it. That's where the right to abortion becomes subject to the state protecting the child and saying no more. The state may protect the child after the first trimester. That's why even to this day, all kinds of news reports, all kinds of opinion polls, and the thinking of people is that Roe v. Wade just gave us abortion in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, first three months. No, that's wrong. It gave us abortion throughout pregnancy. And so originally they were going to put the line here. Then they moved it to viability. But even then, of course, they allowed it beyond viability. But they moved it to viability to stay in the second trimester. The state may not prohibit abortion. Well, there's a lot more to say about this. The, the subsequent decisions of the court have, in fact, gotten rid of the trimester framework. As I say, the subsequent Supreme Court decisions on abortion have very much altered and weakened Roe v. Wade. But they have not taken away that central holding that there is a privacy right to abortion. And uh, the state may not take that away. We do have, however, in Roe v. Wade, and we'll look at all this more deeply. I'm going to talk to you in a number of other programs about more of the details of this. But just let me finish off by making a few uh, observations here. Number one, Roe v. Wade said that the so-called right to abortion is not absolute and that it is primarily a decision that the physician must consent to. It's a medical consideration. Well, about 4% of abortions are done as a result of the woman's communication with her own obstetrician gynecologist. About 4%. 95% of the time, this so-called physician who's responsible for the medical decision about the abortion is a total stranger, doesn't know the woman's medical history. She never saw the person before. 
doesn't know her. It did say the abortion right is not absolute. It has to be done under circumstances that preserve the safety and health of the, of the, of the mother. And there are even interests of the state in the life of that developing child. The other point I want that we should take away from this, all this consideration of Roe v. Wade is this, final point. No other medical procedure of any kind, no other medical procedure has been designated as a constitutional right. Now you have to understand the implications of this. And here's where we'll wrap up, we'll summarize, and then we'll go more deeply into this in future programs. No, uh, this is the only procedure. And I would argue, it's, it's, first of all, I'm using medical procedure. I should put that in quotation marks because it's actually, abortion is not medicine. Medicine helps the body to do what it's supposed to do, but is having trouble doing. Abortion stops the body from doing what it's trying to do and is doing very well in nurturing, protecting that child. Abortion goes there and weakens the cervix, tears apart the baby, perforates the uterus, does all these things. It's unnatural, not to mention immoral. But for the sake of argument, it's the only procedure that's been designated a constitutional right. And once you do that, the Supreme Court has made itself, first of all, it has handcuffed all the lower courts and all the legislatures from actually protecting the unborn. And a lot of these subsequent decisions by the court on abortion have, in fact, dealt with where is that boundary line in terms of what the states can do in regulating or even prohibiting abortion. That's been what a lot of these decisions have been about, as well as questions about funding Abortion, does the state need to fund it? Can the state stop funding it? And of course, the involvement of also the father of the baby. What about the father of the baby? And the law hasn't done too much to, the courts haven't done too much to give the men any rights in, in all of this. But basically the Supreme Court has handcuffed all the other branches of government and the lower courts and the legislatures and has made itself the abortion review board. The only problem is justices of the Supreme Court are not medical personnel. And so the pro-life justices over the years have said, get us out of this business. Because you see, by putting this in the context under the category of a constitutional right, now you're saying to the states, well, anything you do to tamper with the so-called right to abortion, we've got to decide if that's okay. So then who's doing the legislating? the legislatures that you elected on your state level or the Supreme Court. And what, and, and, and this has set up a, a, a scenario now where it, the answer is, well, only the Supreme Court. And then the legislators feel like, oh, you know, some of them say, oh, this is good. I don't have to worry about this anymore. I'm, I'm you know, uh, the court, they, they, they put all the blame on the court for allowing abortion and then they don't have to be accountable to the people for failing to exercise their duty to protect the life of a baby. Friends, that's all we have time for right now. Let me just say thank you for not only watching, but sharing uh, this information. One of the most excellent books where you can really delve into detail on this is by my friend and colleague Clark Forsyth called Abuse of Discretion. The Inside Story of Roe v. Wade, Abuse of Discretion by Clark Forsyth, key pro-life attorney. I've got to go into a conference call with some pro-life leaders, but God bless you. We'll talk more about all this in future programs. May the Lord bless you, strengthen you, answer all your prayers, and make you strong defenders of the unborn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life. We will talk to you soon.